Welcome back to the additional Bible study. This is the Passion Translation, and this is for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA. And we are completing the Gospel of Luke. We have chapters 23 and 24 to complete this week's Bible study. And we will then go into the altar call and then, then actually close out the Bible study. So we're going to get started. Um, chapter 23, Jesus before Pilate. The entire council stood at once and took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They accused him with false testimony before the governor, saying, This man tells us we're not to pay our taxes to Caesar, and he proclaims himself to be Christ the King and Messiah. He's a deceiver of our nation. Pilate asked Jesus, Is this true? Are you their king and Messiah? And Jesus answered, it is true. Now, I just want to interject here. Um, not in any of the other versions of the Bible did Jesus say it is true. Um, what he said was, he, he, you know, in the Messianic Jewish family Bible tree of life version, his response was, as you say, Yeshua revealed. Yeshua replied. And in the NASB version, he replied with, it is as you say. So it's a matter of translation. And, and of course, we, we need to be careful about translations as well. Now, this is a 21st century Bible. It, it was copyrighted in 2017. So we, we just need to do some cross comparisons as sometimes when we look at these new, newer versions of the Bible. And it is always good to be able to cross-reference to the Hebrew text or, uh, texts and also to the Greek to be sure that, you know, it is correct translation. So, you know, sometimes with the translations, things can get lost in, in word, you know, it, with a word. Pilate turned to the high priest and to the gathered crowd and said, this man has committed no crime. I find nothing wrong with him. But they yelled and demanded that Pilate do something, saying, He has stirred up our nation, misleading people, from the moment he began teaching in Galilee until he has come here to Jerusalem. Jesus before Herod, when Pilate heard the word Galilee, he asked if Jesus was a Galilean, as he knew that Antipas, son of Herod, was the ruler over Galilee. When they told him yes, Pilate saw a way out of his problem, Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at that time, so Pilate sent Jesus to Antipas. When Antipas saw Jesus, he was elated, for he had heard a great deal about his ministry and wanted Jesus to perform miracles right in front of him. Another, I'm sorry, Antipas questioned him at length, but Jesus wouldn't even answer him. All the while, the high priests and religious leaders stood by, hatefully accusing Jesus of wrongdoing so that Antipas and his soldiers treated him with scorn and mocking. Antipas put an elegant purple robe on Jesus and sent him back to Pilate. That day, Antipas, son of Herod, and Pilate healed, healed the rift between themselves due to old hostilities, and they became good friends. Jesus was sentenced to death. Pilate gathered the people together with the high priests and all the religious leaders of the nation and told them, You have presented this man to me, and charged him with stirring a rebellion among the people. But I say to you that I have examined him here in your presence and have put him on trial. My verdict is that none of the charges you have brought against him are true. I find no fault in him. And I sent him to Antipas, son of Herod, who also, after questioning him, has found him not guilty, since he has done nothing deserving of death. I had decided to punish him with severe flogging and release him. For it was Pilate's custom to honor the Jewish holiday by releasing a prisoner. When the crowd heard this, they went wild, erupting with anger. They cried out, No, take this one away and release Barabbas. For Barabbas had been thrown in prison for robbery and murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, tried to convince them it was best to, to let Jesus go. But they cried out over and over, Crucify him, crucify him. A third time, Pilate asked the crowd, what evil crime has this man com committed that I should have him crucified? I haven't found one thing that warrants a death sentence. I will have him flogged severely and then release him. 
But the people and the high priests, shouting like a mob, screamed out at the top of their lungs, no, crucify him, crucify him. Finally, their shouts and screams succeeded. Pilate caved into the crowd and ordered that the will of the people be done. Then he released the guilty murderer, Barabbas, as they insisted and handed Jesus over to be crucified. The crucifixion of Jesus. As the guards led Jesus to be crucified, there was an African man in the crowd named Simon from Libya. He had just arrived from a rural village to keep the feast of Passover. The guards laid Jesus across, Jesus's cross on Simon's shoulder and forced him to walk behind Jesus and carry his cross. Massive crowds gathered to follow Jesus, including a number of women who were wailing with sorrow over him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. You should be weeping for yourselves and your children. For the day is coming when it will not be the women and children who are blessed, but the childless. Then you will say, The barren women are the most fortunate. Those who have never given birth and never nursed a child, they are more fortunate than we are, for they will never see their children put to death. And the people will cry out for the mountains and hills to fall on top of them to hide them from all that is to come. For if this is what they do to the living branch, what will they do to the dead ones? Two criminals were led away with Jesus, and all three were to be executed together. When they came to the place that is known as the skull, the guards crucified Jesus, nailing him on the center cross between the two criminals. When they were nailing Jesus to the cross, he prayed over and, and over, Father, forgive them, for they, know, they don't know what they're doing. The soldiers, after they crucified him, gambled over his clothing. A great crowd gathered to watch what was happening. The religious leaders sneered at Jesus and mocked him, saying, Look at this man. What kind of chosen Messiah is this? He pretended to save others, but he can't even save himself. The soldiers joined in the mockery by offering Jesus a drink of vinegar. Over Jesus' head on the cross was written an inscription in Greek, Latin, and Aramaic. This man is the king of all the Jews. And all the soldiers laughed and scoffed at him, saying, Hey, if you're the king of the Jews, why don't you save yourself? One of the criminals hanging on the cross next to Jesus kept ridiculing him, saying, What kind of Messiah are you? Save yourself and save us from this death. The criminal hanging on the other cross rebuked the man, saying, Don't you fear God? You're about to die. We deserve to be condemned, for we're just being repaid for what we've done. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. Then he said, I beg of you, my Lord Jesus, show me grace and take me with you into your everlasting kingdom. And Jesus responded, I promise you, this very day you will enter paradise with me. The death of the Savior. It was now only midday, yet the whole world became dark for three hours as the light of the sun faded away. And suddenly in the temple, the thick veil hanging in the holy place was ripped in two. Then Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, I surrender my spirit into your hands. And he took his last breath and died. When the Roman captain overseeing the crucifixion witnessed all that took place, he was awestruck and glorified God. Acknowledging what they had done, he said, I have no doubt we just killed the righteous one. The crowds that had gathered to observe this spectacle went back to their homes overcome with deep sorrow and devastated by what they had witnessed but standing off at a distance were some who truly knew jesus and the women who had followed him all the way from galilee were keeping vigil now i just want to mention um you know when the crowds uh prior to his crucifixion um these were the crowds that the the religious leaders allowed to come in to be very loud and verbal. Um, this is where people get confused, you know, and say the Jews, you know, crucified. No, uh, it was the religious leaders and those that were following the religious leaders um, because Yeshua's earlier fo- earliest followers were all Jewish people. So we need to rightly divide that word and understand that no, he still had those those people that that believed in him, and they followed the as as we've just read they they followed him and they actually bore witness to what happened 
and we're, we're, we're deeply mourning. There was also a member of the Jewish council who was eager, um, who was eager for the, uh, uh, the village of Rama. And he was actually from Rama. He, his name was Joseph. And we know this was Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea actually is, is who we're referring to here. He was a good hearted, honorable man who was eager for the, the appearing of God's kingdom realm. Now, even though he was part of the Sanhedrin council, um, being, being a, a Pharisee, he had strongly disagreed with the decision of the council to crucify Jesus. He came before Pilate and asked permission to take the body of Jesus and give him a proper burial. And Pilate granted his request to take the body of Jesus and give him a proper burial. So Pilate then granted his request. So he took the body from the cross and wrapped it in a winding sheet of linen and placed it in a new unused tomb chiseled out of solid rock. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was fast approaching. So the women who had been companions of Jesus from the beginning saw all of this take place and watched as the body was laid in the tomb. Afterward, they returned home and prepared fragrant spices and ointments and were planning to anoint his body after the Sabbath was completed according to the commandments of the law. Chapter 24, The Resurrection of Jesus. Very early that Sunday morning, which is the first day of the week, the women made their way to the tomb carrying the spices they had prepared. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, Jesus' mother. Arriving at the tomb, they discovered that the huge stone covering the entrance had been rolled aside, so they went in to look. But the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was gone. They stood there, stunned and perplexed. Suddenly, two men in dazzling white robes shining like lightning appeared above them. Terrified, the women fell to the ground. On their faces, the men in white said to them, Why would you look for the living one in a tomb? He is not here, for he has risen. Have you forgotten what he said to you while he was still in Galilee? The Son of Man is destined to be handed over to sinful men, to be nailed to a cross, and on the third day he will rise again. All at once they remembered his words. Leaving the tomb, they went to break the news to the eleven. I remember Judas had hung himself after betraying Jesus, and to all the others of what they had seen and heard. When the disciples heard the testimony of the women, it made no sense, and they were unable to believe what they heard. But Peter jumped up and ran the entire distance to the tomb to see for himself. Stooping down, he looked inside and discovered it was empty. There was only the linen sheet lying there. Staggered by this, he walked away wondering what it meant. Jesus walks to Emmaus. Later that Sunday, two of Jesus' disciples were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a journey of about 17 miles. They were in the midst of a discussion about all the events of the last few days when Jesus walked up and accompanied them in their journey. They were unaware that it was Jesus walking along, alongside them, for God prevented them from recognizing him. Jesus said to them, You seem to be in deep discussion about something. What are you talking about so sad and gloomy? They stopped, and the one named Cleopas answered, Haven't you heard? Are you the only one in Jerusalem unaware? Of the things that happened over the last few days, Jesus asked, What things? The things about Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they replied. He was a mighty prophet of God who performed miracles and wonders. His words were powerful, and he had great favor with God and the people. But three days ago, the high priest and the rulers of the people sentenced him to death and had him crucified. We all hoped that he was the one who would redeem and rescue Israel. Early this morning, some of the women informed us of something amazing. They said they went to the tomb and found it empty. They claimed two angels appeared and told them that Jesus is now alive. Some of us went to see for ourselves and found 
the tomb exactly like the women said. But no one has seen him. Jesus said to, said to them, Why are you so thick-headed? Why do you find it so hard to believe every word the prophets have spoken? Wasn't it necessary for Christ the Messiah to experience all these sufferings and then afterward to enter into his glory? And actually, he fulfilled every single prof prophecy um, about his first coming. There was nothing, nothing left undone. He, he completed everything. Then he carefully unve unveiled to them the revelation of himself throughout the scripture. He started from the beginning and explained the writings of Moses and all the prophets, showing how they wrote of him and revealed the truth about himself. As they approached the village, Jesus walked on ahead, telling them he was going on to a distant place. They urged him to remain there and pleaded, stay with us. It will be dark soon. So Jesus went with them into the village, joining them at the table for supper. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. All at once their eyes were opened and they realized it was Jesus. Then suddenly in a flash, Jesus vanished from before their eyes. Stunned, they looked at each other and said, why didn't we recognize it was him? Didn't our hearts burn with the flames of holy passion while we walked beside him? He unveiled for us such profound revelation from the scriptures. They left at once and hurried back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples. When they found the eleven and the other disciples all together, they overheard them saying, It's really true, the Lord has risen from the dead. He even appeared to Peter. Then the two disciples told the others what had happened to them on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus had unveiled himself as he broke bread with them. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still discussing all of this, Jesus suddenly manifested right in front of their eyes. Startled and terrified, the disciples were convinced they were seeing a ghost. Standing there among them, he said, Be at peace. I am the living God. Don't be afraid. Why would you be so frightened? Don't let doubt or fear enter your hearts, for I am. Come and gaze upon my pierced hands and feet. See for yourselves, it is I standing here alive touch me and know that my wounds are real see that i have a body of flesh and bone he showed them his pierced hands and feet and let them touch his wounds the disciples were ecstatic yet dumbfounded unable to fully comprehend it knowing that they were still wondering if he was real jesus said here let me show you give me something to eat they handed him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb and they watched him eat it then they said to them then he said to them, Don't you remember the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you? I told you that everything written about me would be fulfilled, including all the prophecies from the law of Moses through the Psalms and the writings of the prophets, and they would all find their fulfillment. He supernaturally unlocked their understanding to receive the revelation of the scriptures, then said to them, Everything that has happened fulfills what was prophesied of me. Christ the Messiah was destined to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Now you must go into all the nations and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins so that they will turn to me. Start right here in Jerusalem, for you are my witnesses and have seen for yourselves all that has transpired. And I will send the fulfillment of the Father's promise to you. So stay here in the city until the mighty spirit, until the mighty power of heaven falls upon you and wraps around you the ascension of jesus jesus led his disciples out to bethany he lifted his hands over them and blessed them in his love while he was still speaking out words of love and blessing he floated off the ground into the sky ascending into heaven before their very eyes and all they could do was worship him overwhelmed and ecstatic with joy they made their way back to jesus they made their way back to Jerusalem, um, and every day they went to the temple praising and worship God. So they had seen him ascend, and they were they were to wait also um, for the Ruach Hakadesh, the Holy Spirit, to descend on them, because Jesus had had promised that you know he was going to the Father, if, but he was going to send a Comforter. So that is the end of our. Bible study and the end of the Gospel of Luke.
next week we are going to be reading from the Gospel of John. And we will be covering 10 chapters. So that's a lot of, uh, it's a lot in, in the Passion Translation um, to cover. So we'll see. We may end up having two parts again next week. I'm not sure. Um, and definitely I'm going to, what I'm going to do with, with the book of Acts is separate that out a little, a little bit more since these um, chapters are pretty long. Um, so, but anyway, we're going to be doing um, the introduction to John next week and then the first 10 chapters. And then the following week, we will finish the gospel of John. And that will be the four gospels that we have um, read through from the Passion Translation. Then we'll be getting into the epistles. And there's quite, th that is, is a big chunk of um, the New Testament. And um, that's about it. Father God, we just want to thank you. Thank you for the ability to be together, to study your word in yet another version of the Bible and to be open to your word. Your word is faithful. It is holy. It is true. We love reading your word, Father God. And we're in awe of your word because we're in awe of you. We love you, Father God. We give you all our praises and all honor and glory belong to you. And we pray this prayer in the name, above all names, the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. So we're going to do the altar call and then we will close out for this week. As we just read, Jesus was crucified and he did that for us. He did that so we would have a path to redemption. Um, he took all of our sins with him on the cross and he died an agonizing death. So salvation can only be achieved through the Lord Jesus Christ. His Hebrew name is Yeshua and it means salvation. And what we just read was, it was so horrible what they did to him. Um, and it was prophetic and he, he had to really, he had to really prepare himself for that. But I don't think that there's any preparation for, for, for what he went through. But knowing that he was obedient to God all the way to death. And he did it out of love. He did not have to leave his heavenly estate to to come here to die a horrific death like that he he was perfect he was pure sinless blameless but that is the very reason why he was our passover lamb he was he he was the one that was perfect to take away our sins now when we look at the foreshadowing of the Passover lamb, um, and actually of, of the animals that were sacrificed for sin, the, it, you know, as, as we've been reading in the Tanakh and reading in our, reading in our, um, main Bible study, as well as, uh, the Torah portions that we read, uh, in Shabbat service as you know, with all the, the sacrifices and the offerings, it is very much specified that those offerings have to be perfect, blemish-free. They had to be the finest choice to offer before a holy God to cover the sins of the people. And it only covered the sins. So there was a lot of blood that was shed year after year after year for uh, the covering of, of the sins of the people. Now, Jesus was the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He was perfect in every way. He never sinned. So he was the finest choice, the best choice, because none of us could ever, you know, fulfill anything in, in, in that realm because we're living in a fleshly body. We were born in, in the line of Adam, which because of the original sin, we're born into sin. Uh, we don't really have much of a choice there, but that, that is, uh, the fact that we're born into a sinful fleshly body. Now, Jesus was not born through the line of Adam. I know that it gives the genealogy that goes all the way back to, to Adam, but he was actually born of a virgin and the spirit of God breathed into her. 
So he took all the sins of the world with him when he laid down his life on the cross so that the world could be redeemed of sin forever. And the blame for Jesus' death on the cross is everyone's sin. So we do, we need not blame this group or that group of people, whether it was the Romans, you know, uh, that actually carried out the crucifixion. There's there's The blame needs to be placed on everyone's sin. Because if there had not been any sin, he would never have had to do this in the first place. So we need to look at each and every one of us, ourselves, because he died for our sins. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God commanded his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. Now there's a choice that everyone makes, and this is an individual choice, choosing whether you will accept him as your Lord and Savior. But understand, he is coming again. That is also prophesied, and that has yet to happen. And we are all waiting for the return of our king. He is the, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he will return to rule and reign here. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. So um, he died for you. He died for me. He died for all of us. He paid each and every one of our sin debt in full. And all we need to do is call on the name of Jesus and you shall be saved. It's that simple. Repent, repent, confess your sins to him, ask for forgiveness and turn from that sin. That's a real simple thing to do. Now the world will tell you there's many paths to heaven, that everybody's going to get to heaven. That is absolutely not true. Jesus said there will be some that stand before him and profess to do all these things in his name. And he will say, I don't even know you. And they will not make it into heaven because they have not been born again and saved. And, and salvation is of Jesus only. Um, the world will tell you there's many paths to heaven and that's not true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but through me, period, the end. That doesn't mean, you know, if you, you know, paid X amount of tithes and did this and that, that uh, it'll change anything because there's no human deed that will get you into heaven. If that were so, Jesus would not have had to come to earth and die a horrific death. So this is a chance to confess your sins, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, be born again. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Actually, in the Gospel of John, which we will be getting into next week, um, actually, Jesus taught another Pharisee sees by the name of Nicodemus that very thing. And he explained, no, you, you, you won't be born again of the flesh, but of the spirit, his spirit. And you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. So if you'd like to be born again into the family of God, have that blessed assurance of eternal life. I'm going to say a prayer prayer in, it in just a few, few minutes. And you can pray right along and be born again and saved. First John chapter 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is the only one. He is the only Savior, the only Messiah who was, is, and is to come. So if you'd like to be born again and saved, you can say this simple prayer. Dear God, I come to you today to confess that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I know that I can't save myself. I do believe Jesus died on a cross, was buried, and was risen, and is coming again. 
I do believe that he is the only Messiah and Savior. And I believe, Yeshua, that you paid my sin debt in full. And I thank you for that. I am here to confess my sins to you and ask for forgiveness. Not only that is... I too accept you as my Lord and Savior, and today I declare you to be my Lord and Savior. I'm asking you to send your Holy Spirit to live inside me, to guide me in all of your ways for the rest of my life. I believe today that I am saved, healed, born again and set free, and delivered from sin and the consequences of sin through you and you alone, Jesus that that is possible, and I am healthy of mind, body, and soul. And I pray this prayer in the name above all names, the most precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, HaMashiach, Amen and Amen. If you've said this prayer with me, welcome to the family of God. I am going to encourage you to get into a Bible-based church or a Messianic congregation, one that teaches directly from the Bible, from the Word of God, and not from ideas and ways of the world and other religions and what have you. No, um, a congregation that sticks to the word of God. I'm going to encourage you to get a hard copy of the Bible and for you to uh, individually read that Bible. I'm not going to tell you which version to get because that's a hard one to, to say because um, there's so many versions of the Bible. I'm going to encourage you, though, for it, for making a first Bible Bible purchase to go to Bible Hub or Bible Gateway, and you can sample out the different versions on those websites. And Bible Gateway actually has a drop-down menu. If you put in a verse, you can go to that drop-down menu, and you can see all the different versions. So you can click onto those versions and read how uh, each of the, you know, those versions sound with that particular ver verse. And I would say the one that you're most comfortable with is probably the one that you should purchase because that's the one you're most likely to commit to reading the Bible. So, and that is certainly what, what we want you to do. Um, and you will get to know the heart of your Heavenly Father. You're now born into the kingdom of God, whereby the creator of all things is your heavenly father and he loves you so much. So he wants relationship with you so you can talk to him at any time. Pray to him, develop that relationship with him. And a good way to get to know him is to read his word. And the word is also good for your spirit. Your, your spirit needs food and this is the nourishment you give your spirit. With that being said, I'm going to bring the Bible study to a close with the Aaronic Blessing. It's also known as the Priestly Blessing. If you have attended any church service, any synagogue service, this is actually usually the conclusion. Um, a lot of the bulletins will just have it uh, named the benediction, um, but this is exactly what it is. And it is from Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. This is when the Lord spoke to Moses telling Moses to speak to Aaron and his sons that he wanted to put his name on the children of Israel and he wanted to bless them. And he had specific words. The specific blessing uh, was to be spoken over the, the children of Israel. Now Aaron was the high priest and his sons were, were Levite priests. So they ministered to the people. Now Moses would get, get word from God and, and um, Aaron would convey it to the people and that this blessing has been carried forward into time and here we are in the 21st century still proclaiming this beautiful blessing from Adonai from the Lord um, this blessing is also for you who are born again into uh, the family of God so he has actually God once you've been born again and saved God is put his name on you as his child. He has written his name on you and sealed you with his Holy Spirit. You are his child now. 
So this blessing, I'm going to say in Hebrew first, and then I will say it in English. In Hebrew, it goes like this. Ivarekaka Adonai ve'ishmareka, ya'ea Adonai panavaleka v'ikuneka, isa Adonai panavaleka ve'asem leka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Have a good rest of the week, everyone. God bless each and every one of you. Um, we will be seeing you on Shabbat this this weekend. Um, and this weekend, actually, uh, we'll be kicking off the Passover week. So we will be then um, actually having the Passover Theater on Sunday. There'll be a lot of other teachings that come up. So uh, in, in the next week, during Passover week, so look out for those teachings. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say. So God bless each and every one of you. Have a good rest of your week.